Hi everyone. So let's get started with the second week's content. So basically this week, we're going to start looking into a bit more formal definitions related to the concepts we saw last week in terms of linear programs, their geometry, and, and the consequences of, of linearity in, in finding optimal solutions. So basically what we're going to try to do is to develop a an algebraic setting that would allow us to describe those structures in a more formal setting. Um, so this is outline. We'll have three parts. Once again, we'll start talking a little bit about some basics of linear algebra that we're going to use throughout the course. Then we'll talk about convex polyhedral sets, which basically are the nature of the sets we obtain when we uh, look at the feasibility sets generated by our constraints in linear programs. And then we'll define these really important terms that are going to be central in the development of the simplex method, which are extreme points, vertices, and, and the notion of basic feasible solutions. All right, so let's get started. Um, so let's start. The first, this first video is about basics of linear problems. Um, well, We'll start with the obvious. We kind of touched that last time, but I just want to do a brief recap to get everyone on the same page. So remember, we're going to have a feasibility set defined by a collection of linear expressions. And we're going to use this matrix notation where each of the lines of my matrix are representing a constraint. Um, and what we're going to see is that then means that we have M constraints in our problem and they involve N variables. My x vector then is an n-dimensional vector, so it's a vector in R n, um, which is representing my decision variables. And you will see that throughout the course, whenever I write a vector, you should assume from the get-go that it's in column format. So we always look into a column, column forms. So these products can be simplified in terms of notation. Mm. Sometimes if, when I need things to be on, on the line, to be a row vector, for example, then then we'll explicitly note that. Okay. Otherwise, if not otherwise stated, it's column vectors is what we're talking about. So x, for example, is a column vector of dimension n, and b is a column vector of dimension n. This b here forming my right hand side of my constraints. Um, we re recall that we write like this, but we mean this to be component wise, right? So it means that I have uh, M less or equal than constraints in represented in this system. So whenever I write this, I don't do any tight squiggly thing or anything to keep the notation clean, but that means you should understand that as being a component wise. Okay. Because this, this is a M, the product, the result, uh, the result of this product between A and X is a M vector. And I'm looking component wise of this, this and comparing, uh, with, with B. Um, so the first thing, um, I'm not going to dwell too much into that. I'm going to jump straight into the main result we need from matrix inversion. Um, but matrix inversion is basically central in, in linear, uh, a linear programming. I say here is the king pin is, is that pin that if you remove everything else falls apart. And because the reason for that is because you, what linear programming and the methods used to solve linear program problems, they are based on systematically solving linear systems over and over and over again. And I don't know if you remember from linear algebra, but whenever you have a system, a system of equations written of this form, um, given, given, you know, that your matrix A is invertible and so on and so forth, this thing can be solved by doing this, right? By pre-multiplying both sides with the inverse of A. So that means that being able to calculate this matrix is what allows us to solve these systems. So basically what we're gonna do is in, 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 in reality, we don't really end up actually calculating these inverse matrices, but what is actually done, and you've probably seen that in some course in computational linear algebra, for example, is that um, you use equ equivalent operations so you can find these, the results for these, without actually calculating inverses, but using matrix decomposition techniques. 
Uh, but because it's equivalent, we can develop theory based on the ideas that involve the existence of inverse matrices. So just to level up everything um, from what we're going to be talking from onwards, let me just go over very quickly a definition of matrix inversion. It's basically um, the inverse of A is denoted like so, and it is that matrix that when I post multiply by A, I obtain a identity matrix with ones, it's a square matrix with ones in the main column and zero everywhere else, okay? And um, one important aspect associated with inverses for us is uh, when it exists, okay? And and the, the existence of inverses is, is somewhat related with properties of the matrix properties that the matrix A has. Uh, before we go on and, and talk about the existing properties related to the existence of inverses, um, let us just briefly talk about the notion of linear independence. Because um, as we're going to see in a second, the, the structures defined within the matrix A, they, the, the fact that they I, are linear independent my, would lead to the notion of existing uh, inverse matrices. So that means that let us first click, quickly go over the definition of linear independent vectors. So linear independence, I'm going to always be referring to those as using Li. So Li might mean linear independence or linearly independent vectors, okay? But let's let's just very quickly look at that. So we have we have a collection of vectors, and by the way, this is how I denote collection of things. This is the equivalent of having a set of x1, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way to xk. Okay, so for, you know to make things compact, I I denote it like so. They are they are said to be linearly de dependent. If you can find um, real numbers, a collection of uh, real numbers, one for each vector, such that when you add, when you multiply by each of the vectors and you add them all, you can make them cancel out without cheating by making all of them zero. Because this would be a, a trivial result if you can just make all the a's, the coefficients a zero. But if you can't and you still find a way to cancel them out, to cancel the vectors out, then you say that they are linearly dependent, okay? Otherwise, if you can't, then they are linearly independent. So basically, it means that given a vector, if given a collection of vectors, they are linearly independent if the elements of this collection cannot be written as a linear combination of the others, which, by the way, this, this trick of getting real numbers, multiplying by vectors and adding them up is what we call a linear combination. This is gonna pop up quite a few times as well. So I have here a picture uh, where I show um, a couple of vectors. So this is, this, suppose this is, we're talking about R2. So this is the plane, this is defined on this plane here, so this could be say x and y, okay? So in R2, two vectors, if they're not, if they're not parallel to each other, or they are not on the same line segment, um, they are linearly independent. It means that by, by only looking at this vector, I cannot write this vector, or by only looking at this vector, I cannot write this vector just by multiplying the other by a coefficient. Because if I say I get x2 and multiply by a coefficient, what I can make it, I can make it bigger or smaller if my constant is positive and greater than one or less than one. Or if my constant is negative, I can flip it over this way or make it go that way. But in any case, I cannot write it like this. But now that you look in, you add a third vector into the setting, now, you create dependency between these two because now, for example, I could write, uh, say, I could write, say, uh, x2 by multiplying x3 for a, by a constant that flips it over this way and then x1 a little bit this way such that when I add these two vectors, I get something that equals to x2. So it means that in this case now, they are linearly dependent because I have one of them that can be written 
as a combination of the other. So I'll have these A1, A2, A3 coefficients. With the one that flips A1 again, let's draw that again, that flips, say, X3 this way, that flips X1 this way. When I added them, I get something that looks exactly like X2. So I get one minus something and minus something, add them all and obtain the zero. And that's exactly a linear dependence. The notion of linear independent vectors is really important for us and we're gonna use it all the time. Right. The so now we can go to the to the theorem I was on about when I first talked about inverses. So there is a strong connection between um, a matrix A being invertible and the element of the, this matrix being linearly independent. Actually, this theorem, it's a this is a compilation of important results from linear algebra. I'm not gonna go and prove this, but uh, it's a nice exercise to see if you can find a linear algebra source that can show equivalence of these things. I suspect our textbook might also have one if you want to look at. Um, and it basically says the following. These seven things, they are such that if one holds, the other six also holds. So that that's also holds. So that is kind of what, I, what it means to be equivalent. If you can find one of them being true, it means that everything else is true. Um, and well, we assume if, for example, A is vertical, so that if that is true, then the transpose of A is, is invertible as well. The determinant of, way of A cannot be zero. The rows of A have to be linearly independent. The columns of A have to be linearly independent. And if you find a B, uh, for any B you can find in RM, this system has a solution. And this one is also based saying that there exists at least one for each, there is a solution. So they all hold together. So basically the existence that's this, this, one, these two, and these here, they are kind of tied together. And for us, that will be, have important consequences when we look at the definition of constraints and think about the hyperplanes they're defined, we can look at the normal vector of these hyperplanes and look at relationships that they have in terms of linear independence and use those to try to express what are the nodes, what are the points where these hyperplanes are meeting, remember the vertices, and we can find those by solving systems of equations. So that's how these all things are gonna connect over, you know, all the time for what we're gonna do in the future. So this is a really important result that we're gonna be coming back to um, over and over again. All right, good. Um, Another important thing, the notion of subspaces and, and how they lead to the notion of bases. Um, so a subspace in Rn is just a set that is comprised, is, is the space you get when you do all the linear combinations of the elements that compose it, okay? So this is, for example, saying that I have a subspace S that is given by two elements from S and then I look at all possible linear combinations it gets me, and that forms a subspace, right? By the way, this is the linear combination, the same one we used in, in the context of linear independence. So that should probably start clicking some connections in, 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 in your mind, but we'll get to that anyway, okay? And, and by the way, because now I'm using this just saying that A and B are real numbers, one possible new real number that they can always be is zero. So it means that by definition, subspaces always include the origin. So the point zero zero always is included in a subspace. So to be a, a, a actual subspace, to not use the word, word proper because it's gonna mean something slightly different, um, you have to have your subspace crossing your origin, okay? Which it might be a burden for us that we're gonna go around with a similar a related concepts that we're gonna use all the time. Right, but that's it. That's how we define a subspace. Um, closely related to subspaces is the is the notion of a span. Um, so basically, a span of a finite collection of vectors x i one to k, so a collection of k vectors, is exactly the subspace in R n defined by its linear combinations. So basically, these things are sort of complementary, right? A subspace is what you get when you look at the span of the elements, 
and we just said, so basically if I looked at the span of x, i, y in this case, I would get x, uh, I would get s, sorry. Or in a more general setting, so I have k elements, not only two, but k elements. And then when I look, when I mean, what I mean by when I say the span, the span of these is basically all vectors y, such that when I make a linear combination of these things, it's what I get. So basically, the subspace S, the subspace is formed, it is this space formed by all elements that I can get from a linear combination of my vectors X. So these are, they are almost the same thing. This, the subspace is what I get from this span. I think that's the easiest way of explaining how they relate. And the third important concept here is the concept of a basis. Uh, by the way, we we say basis, so that's the singular, and there is the word uh, basis with an e. So that's the plural of basis, but it also the plural of the word base. Okay, English can be complicated sometimes. So so you will see that whenever I mean singular, I say basis, and with an e, I mean basis plural. Um, but enough of the grammar. Um, so basis is, so we say that a basis of a given subspace is basically, <laughs> the basis is basically, is the collection of vectors that you used to generate a subspace, right? So you get a collection of vectors, you look at the span of it, and then you get a subspace. These vectors is what you call a basis. So you form a basis with a collection of vectors, and when you look at a span of these vectors that form the basis, you get a subspace. We're gonna be using these terms all the time when we're developing, you know, the theory of what's coming up. So it's good that it's it's clear what I mean with these words and how they relate. So it, that we're basically just going through from from through jargon in linear programming, if you wish. But that that's I think that's a really important starting point, even though it might sound a bit boring. Um, but that's it. All right. And um, so here are some interesting remarks um, about about these elements. So the first one is that so all bases of a given subspace they will all have the same dimension. So that means that it doesn't matter how which doesn't matter which, but given a, a given subspace. And you think about possible bases for that subspace, elements that you can look at the span and see that that span generates that subspace, the number of them is always the same. And that is exactly the dimension of the subspace. I have some pictures that we can use, I'm going to use to illustrate that. But that's an important thing. Um, that, now that's the word proper. So um, if it happens that your subspace, it's dimensionally smaller than your actual space, then we say that your subspace is proper. So that means, suppose you are in R3 and your subspace is a hyperplane, a two-dimensional hyperplane. So that's a proper subspace. It's not really fun if your subspace is the original space you are at, because then th these two things have, this, they are the same thing, right? So if you have two vectors in R2, they span R2. So your subspace is the whole thing. But one vector in R2 spans a line in R2. So, so it's a proper subspace. So that's what it means. Um, if S is a proper subspace, like we just said, then this is a really cool uh, fact that we're gonna exploit. We explain optimization all the time, in nonlinear optimization a lot as well, but here we're gonna also look at that quite often, is that if you have a proper space with m dimensions, and that means less dimensions than the n dimensions of my space, you can always find vectors that are orthogonal to that subspace. So it basically means that you can find m minus n, sorry, you can find m minus n non-zero vectors ai that are orthogonal to s. Remember the notion of orthogonality. It means that 
you know, so I have my vector is when I do look at the dot product between A and X, this is zero. This is the equivalent of orthogonal vectors, okay? And you can find that for all the way up to when you reach your, your dimension. I also have a picture for that, so we can illustrate that in a second. So basically, if, you're, if your subspace is proper, there are directions that your subspace is not including that you can find a vector pointing that. But then it becomes kind of a tricky thing because as soon as you include that vector, if you form a new subspace, you, you are removing dimensions of freedom from, from the original space N. Right. So, um, so here are the pictures I was on about. So this on the left-hand side here is, uh, is a proper subspace in R3. So notice I have coordinate systems here of three dimensions. And because I have only a single vector, my, my basis for this subspace, my subspace is all possible linear combinations of this thing. So it's the span and what X1 spans is just this line. And that's all it spans, okay? It's a proper subspace. And then we can look at this in an interesting way. So suppose we can look at a first A1 vector. I'll draw it in blue. So like so, so that could be A1. And that is perfectly perpendicular to that line. And when I do so, I could say create a new, I'm gonna be testing my drawing skills here. S prime subspace now is spanned by X1 and A1, right? Which is a hyperplane in a three-dimensional thing, in a three-dimensional space. And now that I did that, I can go on and find another perpendicular vector. It would be a vector that would be, uh, let's see, it's hard for me to draw. It would be coming out of my blue hyperplane. So it would be something that looks, say, kind of like so, more or less. Like I said, my drawing skills are ridiculous. Perpendicular like so. It could have been a bit bigger. There you go, A2. So, so this orange vector is coming out. You can see my hand here. Here, it's coming out of my hyperplane S prime, which is my subspace is spanned by X1, A1. So you see, I had two vectors that I could find that were perpendicular to my original subspace S because it's a one dimensional subspace in a three dimensional space. So n equals one, n equals three. And here you have a two dimensional subspace. So now I'm forming S, S1 and X2. And you can see, I, I kind of made th this X is shaded there. Um, so you could see that it, it's kind of inclined going below this direction. So it's getting negative in that direction, but it, on this side, this thing is positive. So it's above that. So it's this, and it of course includes the origin because it's a, it's a, it's a subspace. Okay, all right. Um, so that leads us to the first important theorem that we're gonna use in the near future. Um, by the way, we're gonna see a couple of theorems today, but we're not gonna go through the proofs of the theorem during the lectures, because I, I think it's more important first that you understand what the theorem is trying to say, and then we'll work on the proofs you know, with more time, with, with a bit appropriate setting. Um, some of those theorems are going to be covered in the exercises, mostly on the exercises that are assigned for home. And some of the others are going to be covered in, as homework. So you get plenty of chance to think about them, consult some references, and, and try to work them out yourselves. It's, uh, there's no way I can just show you a proof and you, and you understand immediately. So there is not much a point of doing it here. But you, you will go and go, you go, you're going to go through, you're going to work on the proof of the, the important ones, rest assured. So this is the first one that we're going to use in the, in the near future, which is the idea of forming basis, right? So we are trying to form a basis for, uh, for a, um, for a subspace of dimension M. Okay. So basically it goes like, so if you, if you have an S, uh, a subspace S that is formed by the span of a collection of K vectors. And by the way, that subspace has dimension M less or equal than K. It just might be so that you have some vectors in that collection that they are not really playing a role in the span, which you know what it means, right? It means that they not necessarily are linearly independent. Um, 
Um, so two things are true. First of them, there exists a basis with only k elements. Sorry, with only m elements because the dimension of the subspace is m. So in a two-dimensional subspace, I only I have two vectors, and that will form a basis. And suppose I'm given three vectors, x1, x2, x3. So there is, is this a basis for my subspace because this is formed by the span of these vectors. And if for some reason you are short of vectors, so suppose you have k prime vectors that you know that are linearly independent, you can get all the way to a basis of size m, but just starting from these k prime vectors and then choosing additional m minus k prime vectors from that collection. Well, of course, that choice uh, that choice is going to be such that you can't pick those that you already have. Okay, so it's a as soon as you pick a vector to be a part of your collection one to k prime, they are not available uh, in the original set. But if you're picking just m of them, you can guarantee that you form in a basis, and that is going to guarantee that they remain linear independent. And that's a really important result that we're going to use later on um, when we look into the notion of changing from one vertex to the other in linear in in simplex in the simplex method, right? Um, moving on, some some other important spaces that um, we might use. We're not going to do too much on those, but it's good to know. And I might use these these terms ever so often. Is the notion of a column space. So whenever you look at the column space of the matrix A, um, it, this is a subspace in Rn that you spanned by the columns. Um, the row space of A is the subspace spanned by the rows. Uh, so for example, B is presumed to be in the subspace of, of the row space of the matrix A. That's something that we use all the time. And there is the notion of new space um, which is basically the space in which you observe this being the case, this is going to be useful for us in, in a minute. Um, and uh, and mo I think more importantly than, than knowing what these are is, is being familiar also with the notion of rank. So the dimension of these row space and the column space, they, they are known to be the same. So that's something that is not trivial, but you can find references for that in any linear algebra uh, undergrad level textbook. And uh, it's it's basically what connects the column space and the row space of of a uh, of a given matrix. And it, it's known that this this the size of that space, the dimension of that space, is is the rank of the matrix, and it's given by the minimum between the two, the number of rows and number of columns. Um, assuming that you have uh, um, uh, um, you're gonna have the, the number of the linearly independent rows or linearly independent columns. Of course, this is the size of your row space in your column space. And if you have if you have linearly dependent rows or linearly dependent columns, then then this number exclude those, right? And um, and of course, this is the, the dimension of your null space. One, one way of thinking of that is just think about what I just talk, what we just said. So think about your subspace. And if its dimension is m, so it's a proper subspace in Rn, it means that you have n minus m vectors that could be orthogonal. And how we define the orthogonality? We define orthogonality the same way we define null spaces. So your null space will have your null space holds all these vectors that are perpendicular to your subspace. Okay. Um, now to look into something that we actually can use, and it's gonna actually be more sort of more meaningful for for what we're gonna be doing with with subspaces is the precise notion of affine subspaces. And basically, affine subspace, it's... When we talked about last class, we talked about that our objective function is, uh, is, uh, is a linear function and our constraint is an affine constraint. And then I told you something on the lines, well, the main difference, the difference between something linear and something affine is a constant. There is exactly the same thing. The difference between a subspace, which is formed by linear combinations, 
So a linear subspace and a fine subspace is a constant. And this constant in the, in the vector sense, what it causes is a translation. So basically what you have is get your subspace as zero and then add to them the coordinates of x zero, which is a point, a point in, our, in our n, living in somewhere in our n. When you do so, then you get this new subspace, which is s x zero, s zero translated by x zero. S is not a subspace because you because you move in this thing in to the x zero coordinate. You are making it perhaps not having the most likely not have the origin. And when you do so, that means that you get something that is slightly different that we call an affine subspace, which is basically a translated subspace with the same dimensions. Of course, it's the same dimensions of the original S0 because you're not transforming the space in any way, nor adding elements to it. You're not adding more vectors to form it. You're not changing the basis of it. And by the way, these affine subspaces, they, they sort of form the, the basis, the, the foundation for, for describing uh, linear programs algebraic. So um, let's look for an example. So you have this matrix A that is M by N and the B vector of size N. Um, and let us look at the space defined by the variables, the vectors X that satisfy my set of equalities AX equals B. By the way, um, this is meant to mean, you know, this is, is such that. So I, most of the time I use uh, a column, but Sometimes I forget I use the bar, but I meant this means such that. Um, and um, so suppose that you know a point that is satisfy this set of of a constraints. So these these equations, the set of equations. Then, if you for any x that might belong to the subspace which is defined by the axis that satisfy this then you'll notice that this is true because if it satisfies the equations, then you can write that. This is obviously the case for a point that was already in the subspace, so you can write it like so. And this is telling us something really important. It's basically telling us that everything that is satisfying this set of equations is a member of the null space of A. So all vectors uh, x will satisfy S, even only if, when I look at the vector pointing from x0 to that x, and remember that I, I use this mnemonic that whenever I want to know what 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 is the, the 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 edge of this vector, I just say it points to the positive. So so this is a vector pointing to x from x0 because it's pointing to the positive. Okay, so if that vector x0 pointing to x from x0 belongs to the null space of A. Um, this is just a, a, an algebraic way of describing the, the solution satisfying this set of equations. Um, so, so that means for us the following. It means that we can redefine S, this subspace, this affine subspace, as being simply x plus x0. So all the axes, when they are translated x0, such that these axes live in the null space of A. All right? Um, and that the, because we can define it as, as in terms of the null space, then it kind of gives us an indication of the, the, the degrees of freedom we have when we're looking at this system. Is it very, the old story that you have a system of, of n equations and n variables, how many degrees of freedom you have? Well, you basically have the difference n minus m, which is exactly the dimension of the null space of A. Remember, once again, we're not changing, we're not changing the dimension of the subspace when we make translations. Uh, and of course, we are assuming that n has linear, m in the, uh, a has m linear independent rows. So, so this is kind of a picture showing what we mean by here. The, so suppose we have one equation only. So all, all the axes satisfying that, that equation are those that live in the null space of the matrix A. So that means that uh, I have x0 here is my point and all my vectors x minus x0, so x minus x0, x minus x0 there, uh, if, they are, if they are in S, which is the null space of A, they satisfy this. 
Um, and of course, what is going to happen is that as as this have more and more dimensions, will will you know the 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 graphical interpretation becomes a bit more complicated. But this is is going to be for us um, a really important uh, indicator of how many dimensions we're going to have to be constraining if you want the solution for the system to be unique. Uh, and that plays a really important role in this simplex method as well, well as you're going to see in a couple weeks. Right, so that's a good stopping point. And let's now, uh, in the next video, we'll talk about uh, the notion of polyhedral sets and specifically uh, convex polyhedral sets. So see you then.